In episode one, we learned that a house fire on April 28, 1908, located on McClung Road in LaPorte, Indiana, had taken the lives of four people. A woman who has yet to be determined, but believed to be Belle Gunness, and her three children, Myrtle, aged 11, Lucy, aged 9, and Philip, aged 5 years. A search was conducted for Bell's ex-farmhand, Ray Lamphere. He was a suspect because Bell had reported he was insane, in love with her, and she feared for her life. Welcome to Episode 2, After the Fire. Before the four burned bodies were found, the search for Ray Lamphere ended very quickly as he was found working at his job as a hired hand for a farmer, John Wheatbrook. He was taken into a port without difficulty and charged with arson. Indiana law stated that any arson resulting in death would carry a charge of first degree murder. He was held without bond waiting for the grand jury for May 11th. Prosecutor Ralph Smith and Sheriff Smutzer attempted to coerce a confession by what was called sweating, which today would be called interrogation. But Ray Lampier stuck to his innocence. Bell's hired hand, Joe Maxson, was interviewed to get the story of what happened the evening before the fire. He said at around 6.30 p.m. he joined Belle and her three children, Myrtle, Lucy, and Philip, for supper. He said he hadn't noticed anything unusual that night and he was in bed by 8.30. Maxon said he was usually a light sleeper and he didn't hear any barking from Belle's dogs who were chained that night, as usual, out back. Joe Maxon said, the dogs would have barked had anyone came on the property. On April 30th, two days after the fire, relatives arrived on the scene. Bell's sister, Mrs. Nellie Larson, along with her son, John, arrived from Chicago. John told of his Aunt Bell being very strange. Also arriving was Mrs. Leo Olander of Chicago sister of Jenny Olson, who was Belle's foster daughter. Belle had raised Jenny since she was a baby. Jenny Olson was thought to be in California at a finishing school that Belle forced her to go to. Yet no one had heard from Jenny in quite some time. Her sister feared Jenny may have died in the fire too. On the third day after the fire, the real horror would begin. Included were hired hands, deceased husbands, would-be suitors, prominent citizens, and political rivals. The main character, Belle Gunness herself. Ashley Helgeline, a Norwegian farmer from Aberdeen, South Dakota, played a major role in uncovering what would be the biggest crime scene in its day. His brother, Andrew, had not been heard from since January 2nd, 1908, when he left home to visit LaPorte, Indiana. He said he'd be back in about a week. It's now been two months. Astley had found letters that had been written to Andrew from Bell Gunness. In the letters, he found that Bell was urging him to sell his farm and stock and bring the money to LaPorte, where the two of them would have the finest home in Northern Indiana. One of these letters, dated September 17, 1906, can be seen to this day at the LaPorte County Historical Society. Astley wrote to Bell asking for information about his brother. In a reply, postmarked March 9, 1908, Bell said Andrew had visited her for a little over a week in January, but had left to go to Chicago and then perhaps to Norway. She said he had planned to return to her after the trip. As they wrote to the Laporte police and received an answer from Chief Clinton Cochran, who said he thought a man who might be Andrew had been in Laporte. 
This prompted more letters between Bell and Astley. Bell was blaming Ray Lanfear, saying he was intercepting letters from Andrew to Bell. Bell was setting up the story to make Ray Lanfear look guilty, all the while pretending Andrew had sent her many letters on his trip. Astley already knew that Andrew had sent money to Laporte. Another brother, Henry, had asked the First National Bank in Aberdeen, North Dakota, if Andrew had drawn out any money. The bank verified that money had been sent for collection at the First National Bank in the city of Laporte. A query to the Laporte Bank brought info that Andrew was indeed the man who picked up the money there. The last letter from Bell to Astley was dated April 24th, to which she invited him to visit her in May. On May 1st, Astley received more info from the Laporte Bank. It was a copy of a local newspaper, the Laporte Herald, telling of the fire at the Gunnis Farm and four bodies were found. Astley arrived in Laporte on Sunday night, May 3rd. A visit to the sheriff got him a ride to the Gunnis Farm. Astley loved his brother and just had a nagging suspicion that Bell had something to do with his disappearance. He looked around the place and talked to Joe Maxson and Daniel Hudson, who were there during the fire. He just wanted to find something there linked to his brother, Andrew. On Tuesday, he returned to the farm where he found Joe Maxson and Daniel Hudson again, working on cleaning up rubble. Joe nor Daniel knew anything more to tell Astley other than Bell had told them that Ray Lanfear was jealous of Andrew because Ray had been in love with Bell. What happened next was later explained this way by Astley. I walked all over the farm around the house, back to the cellar, asked some questions again, whether there were any holes in the ice on the lake in the winter, how deep the lake was, etc. I told the boys goodbye and I started down. When I came down onto the road, I was not satisfied and I went back to the cellar and asked Maxon whether he knew of any hole or dirt having been dug up there about the place early in spring. He told me he filled up a hole in the garden in March. He did not remember the date. Mrs. Gunnis had told him she had the hole dug to put rubbish into it. Mrs. Gunnis helped raking, picking up old cans, shoes, and rubbish, and the man Maxon, I think, wheeled it in a wheelbarrow to the hole and dumped it in. I got Maxon to show me the hole and all three of us started to dig. In a short while, they noticed a bad smell. The men kept digging until they hit something hard, covered by a gunny sack. Lifting the sack, they saw a human neck and arm. Shocked and sickened, Joe Maxon summoned the sheriff. The persistent Astley had found his brother. Under the direction of Sheriff Smutzer, more digging uncovered arms, legs, and his head, all of which had been cut neatly from the torso. As Andrew Hegelin's body was being examined, Maxon pointed out another soft spot a few yards away. Two or three feet down, they unearthed a skeleton that was almost fleshless and appeared to be that of a young girl. The thought was maybe Belle's foster daughter, Jenny Olson, hadn't gone off to school in California after all. Below her remains were more gunny sacks that contained a dismembered skeleton of a large man whose only recognizable features were dark hair and mustache. Digging deeper, they found the skeletons of two children, probably 12 years old. These remains were put under guard in one of the farm's outbuildings. Andrew Hugeling's remains were identified by his brother, Astley. An examination of Andrew's body showed there was damage to several fingers on the right hand and there was strands of hair clenched in his fingers. 
indicating he may have died struggling painfully. With Andrew's body found, a young woman's body found, thought to be that of Jenny Olson, a large unidentified man's body found, and two children's bodies found, makes five bodies found on the first day of digging on what would uncover a whole slew of horror to come in the following days. Stay tuned for episode three to hear more of the story of Belle Gunness and her victims.